Hey there, good morning team. Chemistry Coach coming at you for some really weird stuff. This video and the next video, <laughs> they are serious mind benders. And even if you think you know what you're talking about with the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, I don't know, man. I'll, I'll try to summarize this as best I can. Look at it qualitatively, leave all the gory math out. If you want to take graduate level quantum mechanics courses and start digging down this deep, deep rabbit hole, <laughs> hey, be my guest. But I will tell you, if you start digging and start, you know, hey, let's look into this and what's that mean? And then you dig into that and you start jumping down the rabbit hole, if you know what I mean, woo! You'll just keep going down that rabbit hole, down through the center of Earth and out the other side. <laughs> it's just going to get crazier and crazier. And the fact that some of these big brains formulated this stuff is mind-boggling to me. I'll do my best to kind of give you an overview of what this is, but it really just stems down for some... It's a fundamental concept of quantum behavior, quantum physics. This doesn't really apply to our classical world, motions of cars and throwing baseballs and things like that. This is more kind of something that happens as you're going from a classical world and shrinking down into, you know, the atomic or subatomic world and looking at quantum behavior. This is something that just comes out of that. And Werner Heisenberg in the 1920s, along with Bohr, remember Niels Bohr? You're right, took that quantum behavior of uh, electron um, angular momentum, but he knew there was something flawed in his model. Uh, so he worked a lot with, uh, I think Heisenberg is at the Bohr Institute or something like that. Wow. I, I mean, I, I think Heisenberg, I, you know, don't quote me on it, but I think Heisenberg really brought in um, matrix mechanics. Have you ever done mathematics with matrices? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's some crazy stuff. I think he had to use that to do a lot of this mathematics. It's just weird. So I will open up some rabbit holes if you want to jump down. Great. That's up to you. <laughs> but let's, let's try to simplify it a little bit. There are many different ways you could state the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. But in essence, what Werner Heisenberg was talking about, right? He's looking at quantum behavior, looking at things like electrons and other particles in motion. Remember, trying to locate an electron. Ultimately, it's like, where's an electron? But an electron's a wave. Well, classically, it can be a, it's a particle, but when you get down to fundamental nature, thank you, Louis de Broglie, that electron actually is moving like a wave. So there's this wave-particle duality of matter. But in classical mechanics, it can be a particle or a wave. It couldn't be both at the same time. In the quantum world, uh, it, these are these complementary variables, so they, they're kind of... You know, it can be both. <laughs> it's really weird. So complementary or what they call conjugate variables. One, they, they kind of depend on the other, right? Wave behavior, particle behavior, some other ones. Um, we're going to be looking at position and momentum. So if we got an electron moving and we want to know its momentum and its position, that it's kind of hard to do both at the same time precisely or with a lot of great accuracy. You know, a real bad classical way of looking at it would be like, uh, you ever see pictures of a cheetah? right running and you look at it and the, and the legs are all blurry or a hummingbird's wings and you take a picture and the wings are all blurry so you can't you know you can't really tell exactly where the wing is at any one time it's moving too fast and so there's this this trade of saying hey you know if i take a picture of a cheetah at any one moment okay how fast was it going well i don't know <laughs> you see what I'm saying? But if I if I measure its speed, I don't really truly know where it is. It, it, so the better I know one, the worse I know the other. You see the complementary nature, the conjugate nature of them. It's kind of weird. So there's a lot of different variables that are conjugates or complementary to each other. We're going to focus on position and momentum. In grad school, I ran into uh, things like frequency and time domains. You'll hear this term called a Fourier transform. Ah, ah, sorry for cursing. <laughs> so if you want to go down another rabbit hole, look up what a Fourier transform is. Uh, energy duration, right? The better you know one, the worse you know the other. Again, since we're focusing on electrons, we're going to focus on the position of an electron. Where is it? Around the nucleus somewhere. That's what we're trying to figure out. But thanks to De Broglie, it's a wave that's it's impossible to do and momentum. So I, I'm going to write this in a different way, in an equation that kind of came from Heisenberg's, you know, way of looking at this. And he summed it down quantitatively, saying, hey, there's 
There's just no way you can know both accurately at the same time. At the same instant, you can't both know the position of a particle and the momentum of a particle at the same time. And the better you know one, the worse you know the other. So let me give you a different point of view of how this works out, kind of a more traditional point of view. This is a lot to chew on. All right, so let me write this up on the other on the next board. All right, let's see if we can grasp this a little bit. Pretty famous equation here. Um, so delta x, which is, let's treat x as the position or location of a particle. Specifically for us, we're looking at electrons, but we could apply it to any, you know, kind of a subatomic particle or any quantum level particle. So the uncertainty in this position. So think about, you know, a lot of people look at this from an observational point of view. Really, it's a fundamental, fundamental aspect of quantum physics. Um, but like when we study in lab, you know, we go to measure something, there's an inherent uncertainty in measurements, right? And we can actually measure that uncertainty in the laboratory. We taught you how to do that. But on a quantum level, the same thing's true. If you go measure something, there's an inherent uncertainty, that delta. You can think of it as like a standard deviation or something. So that uh, is the uncertainty. So we think it's here, but really it's a range of, of locations. Um, and then delta P is the uncertainty in the particle momentum, P being momentum. Remember, momentum, momentum in physics is mass times velocity. And so when we looked at the de Broglie wavelength, remember the, the de Broglie wavelength was, um, I think it was Planck's constant over mass times velocity. Well, you could also write that as Planck's constant over momentum, right? So you could, you could look at de Broglie wavelengths in terms of momentum as well. So momentum and velocity are related by the mass. Um, so there's some inherent uncertainty in measuring a particle's momentum as well. And the better, and what this really states, there's a fundamental limit, right? If we take the uncertainty in the position and uncertainty in the momentum, or whatever conjugate variables, energy, duration, frequency, time, put them in there, wave behavior, particle behavior, the better you know one, the worse you know the other. This is the uncertainties, right? And it has to be at least a minimum value. It can't be zero, right? And that comes down to the Planck's name. This Planck's constant keeps popping up again, right? I didn't mention it, but in the photoelectric effect, Einstein was able to derive Planck's constant, which matched, matched what Planck's did. It's pretty, it's interesting, like a fundamental limit. So h over 4 pi, that is mathematically the lowest you could get if you combine the two uncertainties. It's got to be at least that or greater, right? So ultimately what this says is the more precisely we know the location of an electron for us, the worse we know its momentum, right? How, how it's moving. The better we know its momentum, the worse we know its location, right? Oh, okay. I'm going to pictorially look at this. Um, there's a couple views of it. There's a wave mechanics view of it, right? We're looking at electrons as matter waves. Thanks to Broglie. Um, and the problem with Heisenberg now is we can't we can't precisely locate the electron, so we can't treat it as a hard sphere. We gotta spread it out. It's like a spread out region of negative charge. I'll I'll kind of you know maybe I'll do that on the next board. Give you this this oversimplified view of an electron. Um, so it, it's easier to look at it with wave mechanics, um, but a more abstract but better way to do it is with um, matrices. Uh, not gonna do that. All right, you can take more advanced math and and you know take PCAM or go to graduate level quantum mechanics if you want to look at the matrices of these things. So let's look at the wave mechanics. Look at it. Uh, so I'll give you the oversimplified view in the next one. Then we'll do a pictorial view. All right, here's the ramifications of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle for us as chemists trying to locate an electron or how do we treat an electron? Okay. Now, remember from De Broglie, electrons, particles have wave behavior, especially as you trans down, transcend into the quantum world where they're getting faster and lighter. Electrons actually had, me had measured diffraction patterns. So we know electrons move with wave motion, okay? And we can't, because of Heisenberg, we cannot know its precise position. So here's an oversimplified view of how we're going to have to treat, you know, how Bohr treated uh, an electron. And that's why his Bohr model didn't quite work. Um, but it was a good start. And then how we're going to view an electron now when we get to the more advanced um, wave mechanical view of electron motion. So now let's look at an electron as a smeared out region of charge, like, like the hummingbird wings, right? Or the cheetah legs. It's just blurred out. So where's the hummingbird wing? There. 
Not there. It's there. Spread out over that region. Where's the cheetah's legs? I don't know. It just, they all look like one blur underneath its body. You know what I'm saying? Oversimplified view. It's hard. Sometimes there's quantum behavior that it's hard to find a classical analogy. It's like, it just doesn't apply. So we're going to treat that electron as a smeared out region of negative charge. Right? Whereas Bohr treated it like a hard sphere point particle moving in these classical orbits. No, it's a spread out region of negative charge over some space around the nucleus moving as a wave. <laughs> oh man, does this get crazy? So it's kind of like you can think of it as putting a blob of paint, right? That's how Bohr pictured an electron. Whereas Heisenberg said, no, get the paintbrush and spread that blob of paint all over the place. That's where the electron is. What do you mean? There. <laughs> Just slap me. All right, so let me let me give you a pictorial view of waves, looking at the wave mechanical nature of this. A uh, little more so, you know, you don't really have to understand the next board. It's just a little extra stuff to try to get you to see what's happening. All right, this is extra. No, this is nothing I'm going to test you on in my exams. This, this will kind of a little appetizer for where you're going to go if you become a chemistry major or physics major and start getting into some of this interesting wave stuff. Remember, we're treat treating an electron as a wave, as a wave. I don't know why I keep wanting to say that, a <laughs> wave. So let's take a look at two pictures of the same thing, sort of. So imagine you have a complex wave here, which is actually the overlapping of several waves and I was only had room for four it could be five two whatever but remember when waves interact they undergo interference constructive and destructive interference if it's you know complete destructive that wave disappears but usually it's a combination of the two so let's say these four waves when you combine them together gives you this wave or a wave a wave packet right and that's usually what it is um and what you can do, don't worry about a Fourier transform, but a Fourier transform just takes a complicated wave um, that is made up of many different waves and breaks them up into their individual waves or wave functions, okay? Now, that's why it's separated into individual waves and the overlapping of several waves. Here's the two views. And so this is the Fourier transform of that one. And let's look if it's an electron moving as a wave. Let's look at it in terms of these conjugate variables, the, the momentum and the position. Okay, now remember from the de Broglie equation, which is eight, the wavelength of a particle is Planck's constant over mass times velocity, and mass times velocity is momentum. Do you see how wavelength and momentum are related to each other? Okay, so here I know the wavelength of each individual wave. Okay, whereas here it's a conglomeration of those. So you don't know the wavelength quite as well. So if I know the wavelength pretty well, I know the momentum's pretty well. So for an individual wave, I know the momentums well, so the momentums of each wave are pretty precise. But if you look at a wave in general, like as a particle, where is the particle? Where, where is the electron? And then, right? The better you know the momentum, the worse you know the location. It's like, where, where could it be, right? It's hard to figure out. But you'll see as you combine more and more waves together, they start collapsing into the center. You kind of get this average right where it's like well that the 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 position you never know quite you don't know it exactly right but the position starts shrinking the more waves you overlap the more this shrinks and the more you get this larger peak in the center so you kind of know the position a little more precisely the more waves you overlap but the more waves you overlap the less you know the momentum right so here you've got a more precise position but a less precise momentum because you've got all these individual waves. But if you break it up into the individual waves, take the Fourier transform, you know the momentum's fairly precisely, but you don't know the positions precisely. So you can see how these are what they call complementary or conjugate variables. Um, so in this case, one's the Fourier transform or the other. That's the conjugate behavior of it. If you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry about it. You can jump down this rabbit hole, but this is not necessary for my class, all right? It's pretty crazy stuff. All I need you to understand that momentum and position are complementary. The better, the more precise you know one, the less precise you know the other. And the net result is we cannot precisely locate an electron because, thank you Heisenberg, it's a spread out region of negative charge. Thank you De Broglie. 
it's moving as a wave. Feel free to jump down the rabbit holes. It's up to you. Um, but anyway, a little, little more physics than we wanted to go, but welcome to the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle introductory talk, basic 101. <laughs> Good luck with it.